Uh, welcome to section two of chapter twenty-five. We're looking at the uh, we're looking at the reactions to new immigration to Darwin disrupts the churches. This is a part of chapter twenty-five, which is on the urbanization in the United States. Uh, last time we talked about the new immigrants being from South and Eastern Europe. Today we're going to look at the reactions to these new immigrants, who are predominantly eighty percent Catholic, 80, uh, Catholic and Jewish. Um, had funny sounding names to Americans and, and didn't really fit in culturally to the rest of the country. Um, so the federal and state government did little to help immigrants. There just wasn't a lot of programs back then. There wasn't a legal versus, yeah, I guess not illegal, but documented versus undocumented worker kind of situation going on. There wasn't really a lot of work to assimilate the American, them into American society. And so community bosses, political machines, which usually get a very bad rap for, and rightfully so, for corruption and things like that, they actually took care of immigrants. They had people that were there on the docks to give them a free lunch, uh, to point them in the right direction to where their neighborhood was of their ethnicity, help them get a job, uh, help them get housing, schooling for their kids. They built parks in their areas, and they built hospitals and all these things. And so for people that are coming to America and they're very scared, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, uh, they get through all the you know processing in Ellis Island or wherever. They they step off the boat. They step into New York City, into America, and there's someone there to greet them with their native tongue, with a smile, a bowl of soup, piece of bread, and it does wonders because when those immigrants eventually when they grow uh, into citizens, when they get citizenship or when their children do, they remember the bosses that helped them out. Uh, and so really, this is how the political machines work. They exchanged favors um, in terms for for votes. And so they voted for these bosses and the tickets that they wanted. Uh, Americans gradually became aware of the trouble of the cities and a lot of the problems that were going on. Walter uh, Roshan Bush, that's a name right there, and Washington and Gladden were Protestant clergymen who sought to apply the lessons of Christianity to the slums and factories and tried to, you know, the giving alms and helping the poor and, um, you know, just the, you know, the, the love of Christ is what they looked for. So some other things that went to help, you have settlement houses. These are houses that were located in poor urban areas. Uh, middle class, well-to-do people, wealthy um, would be there. They would live, they would provide funding, they'd provide supplies to take care of the local community. Uh, they provided health care. Um, they provided daycare, which daycare centers were unheard of back then. If women wanted to go get a job, uh, somebody had to watch the kids. Uh, they became centers of women activism, of social reform. Uh, religious groups also aided the poor because the government's not doing it. There's no handouts or virtually little handouts back then. And so private entities like charities and religious groups had to help the poor uh, and the needy. Uh, the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, long before the village people, uh, was very famous in the country. And the Young Women's Christian Association offered a place for young people to go uh, be educated, to have recreation, to sometimes just clean up a little bit after a hard day's work. Uh, and then there are settlement houses. They offered aid, medical care, playgrounds, nurseries, libraries, and education. The most famous was located in Chicago. It was Whole House, founded in 1889 by Jane Addams. Uh, there's a picture of it there. It looks like it's on the University of Illinois Chicago campus uh, to provide these services for, for immigrants and for the destitute. Uh, she actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts in 1931. Kind of a, kind of a big deal there. Lillian Wald. Uh, established the Henry Street Settlement in New York in 1893. Very similar situation. Florence Kelly had a lifelong supporter of welfare of women for children and blacks and consumers. All three of them paved the way for future women to enter the profession of social work uh, by trying to better the lives of those in need in their, uh, in their society. And so they were a huge benefit uh, to those areas in which these settlement houses were located. Uh, we have a lot of pictures coming up here. This is a picture of Jewish women working in 1910. Um, working in the factories, you know, um, not sure what they're doing there. It looks like they're spinning something. We've got some men overseeing it. Uh, but you kind of typical work situation back then. Uh, these are Italian immigrants coming into the United, the United States, into New York City in 1910 as well. Um, this is, uh, Pietro learning to write. Uh, the little boy is trying to learn how to write, trying to make his way in the United States. Uh, the way to a better future was education. Oftentimes, the immigrants from the old world learned very or little, very little or no English. It was the children who acted as the translators. They spoke both languages, Italian and English, or Polish and English. And then by the third generation of immigrants, and this is pretty typical with anthropology, sociology, you name it, 
Um, they're assimilated into American culture. They speak English. They don't really know the native tongue. Um, there's always exceptions and things that are different in, in groups, but this is kind of the typical trend. Um, and so the, the, the older immigrants, the ones that were adults when they came here, had a tougher time assimilating to the new American way. Uh, this is, uh, this is doing Italians doing piecemeal work. So they're doing extra work out of the home just for uh, a little extra money, a little extra cash, just to put some more food on the table uh, to provide for all these needy children that need food. Uh, these are Italian workers in 1910, uh, taking some of the lowest backbreak, lowest paying backbreaking jobs that were possible. Uh, this is the census. So if you're into family history, if you want to learn from a primary source document, the census is released 72 years after um, it's taken because that was the average lifespan when they made the law. Uh, and you can find really cool information about what, uh, who was living in the house, where they, your, your family lived, uh, their age. Uh, what country their parents were from, what language they spoke. Uh, this one right here is my, my Italian side. This is the 1920 census. This was, oh, 11 years after they came to America. Uh, and you can see that, the, you know, that the here, uh, this is my grandpa, my great-great-grandpa Guy, born in Italy. Um, he spoke Italian, and you can see that his wife was born in Italy. And then the first three, two kids were in Italy. And then you have Colorado, Colorado, Colorado. So the sign of the immigration that they had children here in America. Uh, this is at Hull House. These are children getting some education, playing a game. It looks like they're maybe playing Ring Around the Rosie, that morbid game from the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, it looks like there. Um, so Americans oftentimes resented immigrants, and South Park lampoons it with the, they took our job, but that idea has been around since the first immigrants showed up. Uh, they claim they drove wages down. They'd taken American jobs. Uh, many of these people were anti-foreigner. They were nativist. Uh, they said new immigrants didn't fit into society. They didn't look like Americans. They didn't speak the language. They brought crime. They brought disease. Um, kind of sounds familiar to a lot of anti-immigration arguments today that's still going on. They blamed them for crime, unemployment, disease, other problems. There was an, even a, a slur, not even a slur, but they'd call them the dirty immigrants. The dirty immigrants was common place to be used in the media and the newspapers and in conversation back then. The anti-foreigner organization, the American Protective Association, the APA, not the American Psychological Association, that's the modern one. Uh, they urged people to vote against Roman Catholic candidates for, for office because Roman Catholics weren't true Americans according to them because they listened to the Pope. I'm not sure how that works. And so you have some new immigration laws. In 1882, immigrants had to pay taxes. They banned criminals from coming to this country. That's probably a good idea. Everyone should pay their share and probably shouldn't let a lot of criminals in. Uh, we have the 1882 very controversial Chinese Exclusion Act, which was extended three times and so for over 30 years, actually all the way to 1943, the Chinese were totally banned from coming from this country. In 1907, there was a gentleman's agreement between uh, Japan and the United States to limit the number of Japanese immigrants coming to this country. Um, and then in 1917, the Immigration Act made them take a literacy test to prove they could read or write in a language, not English, because freedom of speech, uh, you can't have an official language in the United States. Um, you have the right to speak whatever language you want in this country. Most people, people speak English um, or American, depending on if you're in Illinois or not. That's the official language of Illinois is American. Um, but you can speak Spanish, you can be, speak Swahili, Polish, Russian, Klingon, you name it. Uh, all fun stuff. This is uh, looking backwards. This is showing these rich people uh, saying, we don't want you immigrants. Um, but they forgot that they were their roots, that they were once at this time, you know, immigrants as well. And they struggled to make themselves. Uh, this was in the very popular Puck Mag magazine from the late 19th century. Uh and so churches were there to confront kind of this urban challenge. And so a lot of these problems in the, in the, um, the area um, with society, with the poor, we had Protestant churches uh, suffered from people moving to cities. And so there's these new movement of liberal Protestants, which has adapted the religious ideas to modern culture. They rejected literalism of the Bible. They said, yeah, maybe the Bible's not over, you know, 40, the earth's not 4,500 years old or so. Uh, you have Dwight Lyman Moody, an evangelist, a Protestant who preached about kindness and forgiveness, uh, adapted the old-time religion for the facts of city life. The Moody Bible Institute was founded in Chicago. It grew hugely popular. 
Uh, and it was more of a positive message about Christ and about Christianity. Uh, Roman Catholic and Jewish faiths were gaining enormous strength in new immigration. Uh, many of their, their followers didn't feel welcome in the American school system, school system so they broke away and, and started their parochial schools, uh, starting their own Catholic schools and Jewish schools, you name it. Uh, by 1890, there's over 150 religious denominations in the United States. The Salvation Army, founded in 1879, long before the ringing of the bell uh, for Christmas. You have the Church of Christ Scientists, was founded in 1879 by Mary Baker Eddy. Um, they preach that the true practice of Christianity heals sickness. You don't need modern medicine. There's some of uh, um, those followers still around today. This is a picture from the Moody Institute. Morning service in 1908. Remarkably, uh, very, very popular the Moody Institute there in Chicago. And then Darwin threw a little curveball to the churches. Uh, published in 1859 is On the Origin of Species, really opened up the floodgates of evolution. Um, did man evolve from apes, from primates? And if so, that denounces the Bible that shows that man was not created by God. Uh, and that wasn't Darwin's intention. He was a biologist, he was a scientist, just collecting data and using data to come up with his theory. He's actually buried in uh, Westminster Abbey, the church uh, in London, the most famous church in London probably there. Um, he said that humans had slowly evolved from lower forms of life. The theory of evolution cast serious doubt on the idea of religion. Conservatives stood by their belief of God and religion, and liberals took up the mantle that we evolved from uh, apes, and modernists flatly refused to accept the Bible in its entirety. The old chicken of the egg argument, uh, which is just a kind of a logical argument, but really it's if the chicken came first, then, then that really says you're a creationist because... God or higher power created the chicken. Uh, evolutionists would say the egg because you know the animal had evolved from different species and then the egg was first. Scientists will have their own say in that, but that's a whole thing. That's philosophy. We're a history class. Uh, real short kind of video today. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you on the next one.